Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining. I uh, hope everyone is staying safe and healthy out there. Um, one silver lining of the situation we've found ourselves in is that we've definitely seen a spike in online training registration and webinars as well. So thanks for joining. Um, <clears throat> I'm Jacob Zimmerman. I'm a member of the applications group here at BIAMP. Um, relatively new. I think I'm still the newest member of the team, at least in the US. I started here in January. Uh, this webinar will be Room Acoustics for Designers, and this is inspired partly because uh, we recently, in our Tessera 3.14 release earlier this year, uh, we introduced our Parlay processing block, uh, which includes Room Acoustics presets. So we've, we've gotten a lot of questions about what those settings mean and what people should use, and want to give a little bit of background to that as well as uh, in general, we just get a lot of calls uh, from rooms where the audio quality is poor and you know, we look at the DSP settings and do everything we can, but uh, ultimately the issue is an acoustic issue, not uh, necessarily with the system configuration. So it's important to remember that <clears throat> any sound system is only as good as the room that it goes in. Um, so the purpose of this webinar is to give you kind of the tools and language to advocate for good room acoustics, because we know the reality of our industry is that AV integrators and contractors often don't really have a say in the design as much as they would like. And uh, this will help you hopefully communicate a little bit better uh, what problems there are and what, what can be done to help. So let's get started. So I want to start with just uh, some kind of fundamental terminology that we'll be using a lot here to make sure everyone is on the same page here. Um, when we're talking about sound, we're talking about vibrations in the air, and these are measurable. I mean, we can actually um, spell out the <clears throat> size, the wavelength, and the frequency of the oscillations in the air. So high frequency, high pitched noises have very short wavelengths and low frequency vibrations and rumbles uh, have longer wavelengths. So they, they have an inverse relationship uh, in that way. And we can calculate this with a V equals F lambda equation or V equals velocity or speed of sound in meters per second or feet per second. F is the frequency, and then lambda represents the wavelength. So for an example here, we have 345 meters per second. That's approximately the speed of sound at room temperature and a tone of 125 hertz. Uh, it's calculated to be about 2.76 meters or nine feet. <clears throat> now, amplitude is the height or the strength of a wave. And this is independent of uh, frequency wavelength or velocity. This is uh, just a, a measure in decibels. And when we're talking about acoustics, dB SPL, uh, sound pressure level, is what we're after. Um, but amplitude can refer to any audio signal. So dB represents uh, just a dimensionless uh, value. Uh, dBU, dBV represent voltage values and db full scale dbfs represents a digital value so there's a link there with more information on that and everyone will get a, a pdf with all of these links available after the webinar is over another topic is phase so um, <clears throat> we often hear about phase when we're talking about aligning speaker systems, if you have multiple speakers in a room, you need to make sure they're time aligned or uh, if they're out of phase with one another, you'll get constructive and destructive interference. So you can see in this example here, the signals are 90 degrees out of phase, um, which would result in some interference. And actually if they were 180 degrees out of phase, you would get perfect cancellation. Now you'll, no, you'll never really get perfect cancellation in air in acoustics, but we're talking about an electrical or digital signal that is in fact possible. 
Um, and it's good to talk about phase in acoustics as well, because when we have reflected sound off of surfaces that arrives slightly later than the direct sound to a microphone, uh, you do get some of that destructive interference, uh, as well as masking of the original signal, which can impact intelligibility, which we'll talk a little bit more about uh, later on. <clears throat> so the two main parameters, there are several others that we may get into a little bit as well, but uh, the main two parameters that we talk about when we're talking about measuring the acoustics of a room are background noise and reverberation. So background noise is what it sounds like. It's just the sound when nothing is going on in the room, when no one is speaking. And the most common source of noise is HVAC noise. And there are actually two types of HVAC noise. There's a mechanical noise, like the hum of a motor or fan. And these are usually centered around a specific frequency. So uh, these are a little bit easier to address because you know, we have noise cancellation algorithms that can listen and find a steady state noise and cancel it out. Uh, you may remember the earlier days of noise canceling headphones. Um, you know, they did a pretty good job of uh, canceling out the hum of highway noise or a plane engine or whatever, but uh, not always necessarily as good at uh, canceling out conversations or more transient uh, noise happening in the background. <clears throat> and then the other type is airflow, which is broadband noise. So this is a little more difficult to address because it's it covers the frequency spectrum. So even the higher frequencies that impact intelligibility. So, um, the most common cause of this is air velocity. So if there's too much air trying to get through a duct, uh, you're gonna get more airflow noise. So the, the only real way to address this is to increase the size of the air ducts uh, to reduce the noise. <clears throat> and there are a number of silencers available on the market. Um, there's a slotted type or there's the, the round types that are, kind of function like a a car muffler uh, just to reduce the noise coming through air ducts. So there's a link with some more information on that. Uh, the other sources of noise are you know, the environment, um, the noise from outside of the room, anything from traffic, trains, airports, industrial noise, just the uh, steady noise. And it, this can be a little more transient as well. Um, <clears throat> then you also have uh, people noise. I mean, people can be pretty loud and this can be pretty unpredictable as well. Conversations, food wrappers, paper shuffling, typing, that sort of thing uh, can definitely impact your noise level for a conference. So noise criterion curves are a standardized set of ratings that we use to describe the background noise level of a room. And this accounts for the frequency content. Um, so you know, low rumbles or high pitch noise um, you know, can have a different impact on intelligibility or audio quality. So this gives you a single value that kind of weights that based on the fletcher munson curves of equal loudness so you've probably heard of a weighting uh, with uh, spl measurements so these are curves that are weighted to what frequencies uh, are most we are most sensitive to the human ear so you'll see here um, for example a 15 nc rating you know down here at you know two to eight k uh, the noise needs to be very low, about 15, 10 to 15 dBA to meet that requirement. But lower frequencies are a little bit more forgiving because our ears are less sensitive to those. So it um, gives you a better idea than just a, a single noise measurement. So these are 
typical recommended NC curves for different room types. Uh, recording studios and auditoriums are going to have the most strict requirements and uh, conference rooms and classrooms right behind and then depending on the facility um, if it's just program audio or music you may not need as low of a noise floor uh, to get the acceptable sound quality you want. Now you'll notice here that the equivalent sound level is a little bit misleading because it's it's higher than what the NC value is. And that's because if we go back here, it's really based on 1000 Hertz or 1K. 1K is often the center frequency in acoustic measurements because that's about where speech intelligibility is. So generally, I think the, the voice band codec uh, that we call it like back in the early days of analog telephones, you know, the frequency captured was only about 500 to I think 3,500 or 4,000 Hertz, because those are the critical frequencies needed for speech intelligibility. So even if your audio quality is poor, if you're able to capture that spectrum, you'll at least have an intelligible conversation. <clears throat> so this is based on our parlay processing block uh, the room acoustic settings I uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, and this is what we consider to be poor to perfect room acoustics. Greater than 45 dBA is going to be a poor room acoustically and could definitely be an issue. So we we recommend the the lower, the poorer the acoustics are, the less distance uh, between microphones and talkers to reduce that uh, level of background noise and gain required to pick up someone's voice. Um, also worth mentioning here is a uh, signal and noise ratio. So this is a way of measuring the loudness of the content versus the background noise of the room. Now we recommend at a bare, there it is. Uh, at a bare minimum, the signal needs to be at least 10 dB louder than the background noise of the room uh, to even be intelligible at all. But ideally, we like to see at least 25 or more uh, signal and noise ratio for good sound quality. <clears throat> so, and here's an example of how sound decreases over distance. So this is another important factor to consider when you're uh, gauging your room acoustics and your signal and noise ratio. Uh, the farther away a uh, microphone is from the source, uh, the lower uh, the perceived level will be. And in this example, you'll see that, you know, 12 dB uh, quieter at the ceiling mic versus the table mic, uh, and that can, definitely be an issue if there are uh, HVAC diffusers in the ceiling. Uh, we've actually seen often that there are instances where the HVAC noise is just as loud, if not louder than the person's voice. So uh, in that case, you're never gonna achieve an acceptable signal and noise ratio and uh, be able to have an intelligible conversation. <laughs> Okay, so we've talked about <clears throat> background noise. Uh, the other critical acoustic parameter we're trying to achieve good audio quality is reverberation. And reverberation is defined as the time in seconds for sound pressure level to decay by, in this case, 60 dB. Uh, there's some other variants on that we'll, we'll talk about in a few minutes, but uh, uh, in general, it's defines how long it takes for sound to decay by a certain amount uh, in a room. So 60 dB is a pretty substantial uh, decay. Um, if you have a background noise, for example, of 40 dBA in a room, that would require a sound source of at least 100 dB uh, to actually capture a full RT60 measurement. 
So uh, again, there's some other variants on that that we'll talk about in a, in a minute here. <clears throat> so these are recommended RT60 values by room type. Uh, again, a recording studio is going to have the strictest um, RT recommendation at 0.3 seconds or 300 milliseconds. Uh, conference rooms and classrooms, uh, you can get away with a little bit more. Um, in general, the larger the room is, the more reverb you actually want. Because especially if, uh, for example, like a lecture hall or courtroom, if there is not voice amplification in the room, uh, a little more reverberation is actually helpful uh, in order for the presenter to be audible to people farther away. Um, if you have a really acoustically dead space that's large, uh, it can be very difficult to hear the presenter. So, and then you see, in, you know, depending on the application, if it's music, often much longer reverb times are desirable, but not necessarily the best for speech intelligibility. So we see a lot now in new construction of halls and churches that they're changeable acoustics, like panels that rotate, uh, have different absorption levels to, uh, you know, tailor the acoustics of the room for the particular event going on. Again, we're revisiting the uh, acoustic settings in our parlay blocks. Um, we consider a poor reverb time in a room for speech intelligibility to be greater than one second. And perfect is less than 0.3. So we're kind of going by that recording studio metric uh, when we call a room perfect. And generally about uh, half a second uh, is very workable, uh, especially with our other features of our microphones and noise cancellation and such. Um, it really is when we get into the closer to one second territory that a room is really problematic acoustically and may need to be addressed in other ways. <clears throat> so I mentioned RT60. Uh, there are some other variants of RT60. And the first one is EDT or early decay time. And uh, this is just looking at the first 10 dB of decay after a sound source is stopped. And EDT is commonly referenced for specifically for speech intelligibility, because it's really the first 10 dB, the early reflections, the early decay, that are going to have the most impact on intelligibility. If you have a large room with late reflections, uh, there's sufficient decay that it doesn't interfere too much with intelligibility. But if you have early reflections, early reverberation, that really is what begins to poorly impact speech intelligibility. We also have T20 and T30. And these are mainly used uh, as a substitute for RT60. So as I mentioned previously, um, a uh, RT60 measurement can be difficult to achieve uh, without creating a very loud sound in a room. So that's not always practical. Um, and the T20 and T30, while not perfect, uh, can give you a, a fairly good estimation of the RT60 time of a room. Now you'll notice each of these have a multiplication factor to compare it to RT60. So it's, it's theoretically possible that a room can have the exact same value for all of these, but the reality is that almost never happens that there's gonna be some variation in your decay curve over time. There's a larger look at that. So let's talk about room modes and flutter echo. Um, so these are phenomenon that occur based on the natural resonance of a room based on its dimensions. So we talked about wavelength of a sound signal previously. Um, at some point, that wavelength is the exact size of the dimensions of a room. So that 
causes resonance. Um, and modes are particularly a problem in corners because that's where resonances accumulate. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers the uh, harmonics and rope exercise in physics class. Um, this is a similar concept, but we're just looking at vibration in the air. So, uh, for example, uh, if you've got a, a fundamental frequency here, you'll have a high accumulation of that frequency in the edges and corners of the room, but in the center of the room, it may be almost inaudible. Um, flutter echo is a similar phenomenon, but it refers to not so much corner to corner, or edge to edge, but when you have two parallel surfaces where sound is bouncing back and forth. And that's particularly problematic if they're uh, reflective surfaces, uh, more reverberant. And the same goes for modes as well. The more reverberant your room is, the more hard surfaces, the more problem you'll have with modes. All right, let's talk about capturing acoustic measurements because this is really what's going to help you when you suspect you have a, a problem acoustically in a room um, to have some metrics to back that up so you can begin to advocate for a solution. So the example we're gonna use here is uh, an app for iOS called Audio Tools by Studio 6 Digital. And I think this screenshot is out of date because it shows that the app is $9.99. For me, the initial app download was free, but the RT60 upgrade is $35. So that's the only one. In order to do these critical measurements, uh, you only really need to spend $35 for the RT60. The RTA and background noise measurements are already included. And then uh, Studio 6 also makes a USB microphone that you can use uh, with an iPhone with a lightning to USB adapter. And uh, there's a calibrator available as well, although these uh, are calibrated in the factory and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So the calibrator is nice to have, but not absolutely necessary. And then there's also a, a 3.5 millimeter audio output on this mic which allows you to connect it to a powered speaker uh, for playing noise for your measurements. So some measurement tips, um, take multiple measurements, measure in different locations at different heights and corners and close to microphones and loudspeakers and ultimately where people will be talking and listening because the old as uh, we discussed earlier with room modes, the acoustics of a room are not necessarily the same in all parts. You might get particular resonances in certain areas and that, this will give you an idea if you do need to address uh, with ab absorption where the most problematic areas in the room are. And then uh, particularly for background noise, it's important to measure at the right time because noise can vary at different times of the day uh, based on what activity is going on around. And uh, HVAC noise can vary greatly depending on the weather as well. So yeah, you may not know if, the, if you have some mild spring weather, uh, what the HVAC noise will ultimately be uh, when the seasons change. <clears throat> So when you open the app, the first thing you'll want to do is calibrate your mic. Um, but you go down to the settings, go to microphone setup, and you should see your connected device, uh, if everything's correct, uh, through a USB audio one channel there. You hit the little I uh, to expand the settings. Down towards the bottom, there is a button to get file and you can enter the mic's serial number and as long as you have an internet connection it will go and download the calibration file for that specific microphone.
All right, so I'll give a, a quick walkthrough here of taking a background noise measurement. Uh, again, back on the home page of the app, you'll go to the acoustics tools and select real time analyzer. And this will give you uh, a live view of the entire frequency spectrum. So you can kind of see where there might be problematic noise levels uh, related to other frequencies. And then up here in the upper right, you have your global value. <clears throat> so in this case, you see 32.6 dBA is pretty quiet. Uh, I think it, I don't know if it's quite perfect, but it definitely falls under good in our, um, our metrics provided with the parlay microphones. Okay, so I just got a question. Uh, is there an Android version of this software? Unfortunately not, but I do believe there are, are similar apps available uh, for Android, but I, I can't speak personally to those. I haven't used any, but um, there, there's quite a few similar apps available. Uh, well, if you do find one, let us know. We'll maybe make a recommendation for that as well. Sorry, I'm just looking at some other questions here. Okay, someone also asked about sound masking noise. Now that is definitely a problem. Um, in a in a conference room, you want to not have sound masking in there uh, unless that's part of the design uh, to temporarily turn on sound masking for privacy. Uh, but yeah, that sound masking is again white noise is kind of designed to mask um, speech frequencies in the same way that we were talking about with HVAC noise. <clears throat> Moving on. Uh, so to measure the RT60 uh, using the audio tools app, again, you'll go to acoustics tools and go to gated noise RT60. And as I mentioned before, this is the $35 upgrade. So you will need to purchase that in order to use this. Um, in this example, again, if you're using a powered speaker, uh, you can use the 3.5 millimeter line out of the microphone. Uh, once that's connected, you'll see a live view there. So red is the live and then green are the uh, captured measurements. So there's a, a play pause button in the lower left there. You hit play and it'll uh, play a series of pink noise bursts and then take a measurement of your RT60 based on that. Uh, if you go into the settings here, there's some options. You can go uh, T20 or T30. Um, and the default, I believe, is three samples. If you have time and want to do be extra thorough and do more measurements, you can do that. And then the maximum decay time, I believe the default is also one second. But if you anticipate a very long reverb time, you may need to increase that interval. And again, uh, <clears throat> The default is A weighted, and that's usually the most applicable uh, for anything um, with really speech intelligible anything. Like that's what our ears are sensitive to. So A weighting is almost universally used in, in any measurement. So here's an example of our uh, Cascades training room here at Biamp. Uh, you'll notice here we've got some uh, custom art acoustic panels here. Um, and this has been in for several years. I believe this was a custom job at the time, but there are uh, a few retailers out there that you can 
actually upload artwork and have them build panels custom sized or standard sized uh, for your room. Uh, there's a couple links there to that. And then we've also got uh, just a, a standard non art panel on the other side of the room uh, to get absorption on that side. <clears throat> So here's the background noise level uh, measured using Studio 6 with the Studio 6 mic in our Cascades training room. Uh, you notice in the upper right there is your global value. So we, we came in at 39.1 dBA, which is good enough, but not great. We, we don't recommend uh, higher than 40 dBA in conference rooms. And again, that was in the table uh, that we looked at previously. So even with acoustic treatment, uh, again, a relatively low ceiling, we've got standard ceiling tiles. Um, even then, we're kind of pushing it uh, with the background noise level. <clears throat> so here I'm uh, overlaying the NC curves we discussed. So we are just barely compliant with NC30, not quite there with NC25, uh, just a little bit too high low frequency content to achieve that rating. And then these are our RT60 measurements. And uh, you'll notice that, you know, whether you do a T20 or a T30 measurement, your values may be slightly different. Because as I said before, the decay curve of your room is not always perfectly linear. So again, as many measurements as you can get is always preferable because that'll give you more information um, kind of compare different areas of the room, different types of measurements, and kind of put all that together and uh, make a, a judgment call based on that. But always more information is better than less. <clears throat> so, and again, our, our global values here, we're, we're right around the half second range. So that's what we would call uh, fair to good uh, reverb time for a room. So another example here is my home office. Uh, this is where I'm talking to you from right now. And yeah, if anyone's wondering, the, the Biamp mug was very intentionally placed. <laughs> um, so you see I've got some foam around the desk area uh, kind of to take care of the early reflections uh, to avoid any uh, reverberation off the, the painted wood into the microphone. And then uh, behind me, I have two uh, RLX 2x2 two two absorption panels that are kind of centered to my speakers to, again, catch the, the earliest reflections uh, is always best. Um, and then up in the, the ceiling, I have some bass traps as well. And uh, it's it's worth pointing out that the the foam especially, uh, I think all 12 of these squares at the desk were $20 total. I think the bass traps were $25 for the set of four. So it's not always extremely expensive uh, to address acoustic problems in a room. Now the, the Oralex panels are a little more expensive. I, was fortunate enough to get these for free, actually. But I, I believe these types of panels can run anywhere from 50 to $200 a piece. The background noise measured at the desk location is 35 dBA. So pretty good. Not quite recording studio quiet, but close. Uh, definitely a little bit quieter than our training room at Biamp, uh, partly because I don't have forced air heating and cooling. I just have electric heaters. So that's quite a bit quieter than a, we have a you know, typical commercial forced air system at our uh, headquarters uh, in the training room. Uh, RT60 measurements, or I guess these are T20 or T30 measurements, because that's what the app does. Uh, did a measurement at the desk location, uh, approximately ear height. I call that the the sweet spot in a recording studio. Um, overall, 
have got 0.33 seconds. So almost what we would categorize as acoustically perfect. Uh, it's a little bit high in the lower frequencies as you would expect for a, a small space, you're gonna get some uh, mode resonance there. <clears throat> And then just as an example, if I move the microphone up higher, you know, I come in at 0.4 seconds. So depending on the location, you're going to get different values. So in the center, more or less in the center where I'm seated, I'm a little bit farther away from any reflective surfaces like the ceiling or walls or wood. Uh, but if you get closer to a, a surface that doesn't have absorption, you're going to get slightly higher values. And to take that even further, if we position the mic down in the corner where there's no absorption, I get a very high reverb value at 250 hertz. Uh, so again, I could probably mitigate this by adding more uh, foam traps in the corner, but since the values are pretty good at the actual desk location where I'll be listening and talking, uh, it's probably fine as is. All right, so I want to talk about some different design concepts that you can apply once you've identified that you may have an acoustic issue. Uh, what can you do to address it? <clears throat> so there are essentially three things a material can do uh, acoustically in a room. It can reflect sound, it can absorb it, or it can diffuse it which is to scatter it more evenly throughout the room. Um, the reality is most materials will do some combination of the three, but in particular, soft porous materials typically absorb sound uh, acoustic ceiling tiles. And actually the uh, standard ceiling tiles you'll find in most office buildings are actually not bad acoustically. It's definitely a lot better than a, a hard ceiling, a drywall, plaster, anything like that. Uh, more fabrics, carpet, curtains, a material with uh, fabric, furniture in the room, uh, the more absorption you can have, the better off you'll be. And then as also we discussed, if you uh, purchase specific panels, wool acoustic panels that are designed to absorb uh, that may be your best bet. <clears throat> and hard and smooth materials typically reflect sound. Rooms with a lot of concrete, glass, tile uh, are going to be problematic. And it's worth pointing out that paint or lacquer, any sort of finish, can significantly change the acoustic properties of a material. So uh, bare sheetrock, may not necessarily sound the same as uh, a painted sheetrock. So that's important to keep in mind uh, if you're not, if you're making measurements, it, it really should be done after the room is completely finished. And we've even seen examples of acoustic panels being painted, which essentially ruins them. It fills up the pores that are designed to absorb sound and makes them ineffective as acoustic panels. <clears throat> So um, materials are rated uh, with an absorption coefficient. You'll typically see these values listed on any acoustic material you buy. Uh, it's a value from zero to one that represents its percentage of absorption. And usually you'll get a graph like this that kind of shows the absorption across the frequency spectrum. And most any acoustic panel you get is gonna absorb more at higher frequencies and less at lower frequencies because those low frequencies with very long wavelengths are just too big to be addressed properly by an absorption panel. In that case, you're looking more at uh, base traps, corner foam absorbers, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a few minutes. <clears throat> uh, every once in a while, you'll see uh, absorption coefficients greater than one. Uh, what that means is essentially if 
there's surface area added, if there's some absorption on the sides of the panel, that can get you a greater than one absorption. It doesn't actually mean it's absorbing more than 100% of the sound that hits it. So here's just an, another example of acoustic panels and how they might list their absorption coefficients here. Instead of we having a graph, we just have the numbers at different frequency bands. <clears throat> So here's an example of what not to do. <laughs> Just to reiterate what we discussed earlier, uh, all glass, concrete, hard ceiling, this room is just going to sound terrible. So don't do that. So the room geometry uh, can greatly affect the acoustics of a room. Uh, we discussed modes and flutter echoes previously. Uh, these are more problematic in, as I said, reverberant rooms, but also rooms that are not complex uh, acoustically, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, geometrically. So if you have a room that's just a, a square or a rectangle, you're going to have more resonance than if there are things to break up the corners or sound in the room. So geometrically complex rooms uh, typically are going to be more diffuse and have more similar acoustic measurements throughout the room. And you can see in, in most professional recording studio designs, you have kind of chaotic shapes in order to achieve that. Uh, you don't really see very often a well-built studio that's just square rooms, because again, you'll get greater resonant frequencies by doing that. So here's a floor plan of a, a typical recording studio. I uh, kind of got various angles to, to break up the sound. Now here's an example where the room is square. Uh, it didn't have the luxury of designing from scratch necessarily, which is probably the situation many of you will find yourselves in as you're, you're dealing with a room that's already been built. Um, but uh, these corner traps at least help absorb some of the low frequency energy that again accumulates most in the corners of a room. Um, let's talk about curved surfaces. So concave surfaces, uh, domes, are going to focus sound into one location. Uh, convex surfaces are good for diffusing sound. So here we have the dome effect where the sound kind of bounces around the curved surface over to the other side and is focused in at specific points. And a good example of this is the, the whispering gallery at Grand Central Station in New York where even if there's a relatively high level of noise, you can go in one corner and whisper to someone on the other corner uh, because that curved surface uh, with a hard material is carrying that sound, just bouncing off of itself around the, the dome over to the other side. So in contrast, you'll see in a lot of auditoriums and maybe training rooms or any other Place that has a uh, ceiling acoustic treatment, you'll see outwardly curved, convex curved uh, panels, which will help diffuse sound, make it more evenly distributed to all the seats in the room. Here's another example of that. And here's some other types of diffusers. These are more commonly what you would see in a studio, but it has somewhat random geometry in different directions designed to catch different frequencies and wavelengths uh, to, again, make the frequency response of the room more diffuse, evenly distributed. Another example of a diffuser, another type here. And here's a good example. The, the pyramid ceiling uh, diffusers are often 
very helpful for diffusing sound in a room. Uh, th this example is two by two tiles, but there's also a good product here. There's a link to that. Uh, it's just a, a single diffuser that's designed to fit in a ceiling tile grid. So just adding a, a few of these to a room can potentially make a, a big impact on the acoustics. Or if you want to get really crazy, uh, here's an example of a studio in Nashville that uh, is created from a, a 10,000 page Excel spreadsheet uh, to get the most diffuse frequency response possible. So 100,000 pounds of wood, no two being the same size or length. This is diffusion taken to the extreme. And here's just another look at a quadratic diffuser calculator. These can actually be custom built to address certain frequencies. If you take measurements of a room and you have a particular range of problematic frequencies, you can actually design or choose a diffuser specifically to address that frequency range. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about isolation. Again, this is probably getting a little too into the studio building and not so much uh, what's often practical for our application. Um, but just so you have some of the concepts, uh, as one would expect, sound isolation of a single wall is dependent on its mass. So a very thick, heavy material is going to isolate better than a you know, a plywood uh, wall with no insulation in it. <clears throat> so doubling the thickness of a wall, uh, the rule of thumb is at attenuate sound leakage by about 6 dB. Um, but what is really most effective is if you have a double wall with space inside. And this is, again, common in studio construction is to just have another wall inside of another wall. Uh, and commonly, there's insulation or foam or absorptive material inside. It's also important to remember that a room is only as soundproof as its weakest link. So doors, windows, vibrations through structural components, uh, it's another thing to keep in mind is if you have like columns or beams that are connected to other rooms in the building, sometimes covering those with absorptive material uh, can do a lot to prevent sound from being transmitted to other areas. Another thing to keep in mind is solid materials. So just as rooms have resonant frequencies, solid materials have resonant frequency. If you've got a six inch thick concrete wall, it's going to have a specific resonant frequency where you'll see a dip in the isolation provided. So again, that's another reason why the, the double wall is most effective, especially if they're different materials with a different frequency response, you can kind of address uh, with a multi-layered approach there. Okay, well, uh, thank you for joining everyone. Uh, stay safe and healthy out there and uh, expect more to come from Biomp on acoustics topics. Have a great day.